While we're still having um, some people joining, uh, I think we're going to start. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I am Laura Sakin, Manager of Preservation and Outreach at Friends of the Prairie Side. Tonight, we have a wonderfully special audience from all over the world. Many of you are regulars here. I do recognize some names. But for those who are not familiar with our organization, Friends was founded in 1982. And since, since then, we have been dedicated to the architectural legacy, livability, and sense of place of the Upper East Side. Tonight, we will be joined by Andrew Alpern and Simon F Fieldhouse, all the way from Sydney, Australia, where he's enjoying his Friday morning. Andrew is an architectural historian, architect, and attorney who is an expert on historic apartment houses in New York. Here, he is also a very prolific writer with 10 other books published. And tonight we'll hear him talk about his most recent book, Posh Portals. The book contains beautiful photographs of some of the most detailed entrances in the city and wonderful illustrations done by Simon. As I have mentioned, Simon is an artist based in Sydney, Australia. While in the past he has worked briefly as a lawyer, he is better known by his illustrations and paintings. His works have been exhibited widely and even became a collection of greeting and gift cards. Before I pass the mic to our speakers, I would like to remind everyone that if you'd like to ask a question, please do so via chat and we'll get to it during the Q&A. Good evening, Andrew, and good morning, Simon. The floor is yours. Good morning. Good morning or good evening uh, for those here in New York. Uh, because of the uh, sponsorship uh, of this um, uh, event, I'm under the impression that a very large number of you uh, live on the Upper East Side. And I will be showing you pictures of perhaps buildings you may know. But to begin, we have to go to the other side of the park because that's where the story actually began. In 1884, the first luxury apartment house in New York was built. That's the Dakota at 72nd Street and Central Park West. Andrew, yes. sorry for interrupting. Your screen is not sharing. You're not seeing me? Uh, no. Not yet. Uh, well, I, I, I wasn't sharing the screen yet. Oh, OK. Just yeah. want to make sure. Sorry about that. OK. okay. Um, I had. Uh, uh, just uh, uh, introduced the Dakota. Uh, this was designed to be the most luxurious apartment house that New York had ever seen. Uh, it wasn't the first apartment house, uh, that was 10 years earlier, but it was the first luxury apartment house. Now, in order to do a um, luxury apartment house properly, um, all right, there we are. Um, uh, you need to have a luxury entrance. Now, the entrance on the cover of my book is certainly a luxury entrance. This is not the Dakota. Uh, this is the Apthorpe at 79th Street and uh, Broadway. But this is the entrance to the Dakota. What Henry Janeway Hardenberg, the architect that uh, Edward Clark had hired, what he wanted to do was make the act of entering the building much more than merely going through the door to get inside. So he created this vaulted archway 
much taller than would be actually needed for a carriage, uh, put it behind wrought iron gates, and those are in fact, at least the lower part of them, uh, the original uh, wrought iron gates from 1884. Uh, once the carriage went through this um, tunnel and this one-story arch, it could go into a courtyard in the middle. The building is a square donut uh, with a courtyard inside uh, to drive around in and drop off the passenger at any one of the four um, elevator uh, banks that were serving upstairs uh, for the apartments. Um, but it wasn't enough just to have uh, an actual uh, one-story arch. Um, Hardenberg designed an additional two-story arch on the outside to accentuate the act of entering even more than merely that lovely groin vaulted uh, tunnel. Uh, Simon, in doing this uh, delightful drawing uh, of the entrance to the Dakota has uh, shown um, the quintessential New Yorkers out walking their dogs. The dog that uh, the one fellow is uh, walking, if you can call it that, is of course a small version of the Snoopy balloon uh, that we all remember uh, a few years ago being in the Thanksgiving Day Parade. Uh, I didn't catch- Can I just say, can I, can I add something? Please. Andrew, can I say something? Please do. So. And this is more a bit. Of, this is a bit of social history. So, as you know, I come from Sydney in Australia. I actually live in an apartment building, nothing like your beautiful ones there. It's a modern building, but uh, I remember when I first went to New York, I was to as we all are totally struck by the fact that people in apartment buildings were allowed to have dogs, and you'd see them out walking on the street, and see them coming out. We, this was just unbelievable. We couldn't believe it was completely against the rules in Australia to have a, a dog in an apartment. So it's now two thousand and twenty. And in the last, I don't know how many, I suppose what in the last 15 years, there are dogs everywhere in a park. In our building now, there must be about 10 or 15 dogs. That would have been, I remember there was like outrage if a dog even came in the entrance when I, and I remember that's part of the thing that struck me when I went to New York. It seems so incredibly unusual. Now, of course, it seems completely ordinary. It's funny, isn't it? How times change. Just who would have think? So I remember at the, at the yeah, anyway, that's just the dog story. Yeah, it, it, it's very interesting. The co-op where I live on, um, in Chelsea, uh, from the time uh, it was built when I moved in 58 years ago, dogs were not allowed either. And yeah. gradually yeah. they came in and we are overrun with them. And I, I think they make nice neighbors. Oh, they do. And also those lovely scenes of the dog walkers. With the uh, with the, the the dog walkers with you know like ten or fifteen dogs, I remember being totally captivated by them. We don't have that so much in the city here because we're more suburban than in Manhattan. However, um, it was yeah, that's it's just interesting to note, isn't it? How times change. Yes. I yeah. like the dogs. You get yeah. in the lift now, and there's a dog there, and it's uh, I want to adopt a dog as well. All right. So I'm going to I'm going to become a foster parent and have the poodle from downstairs come and stay on the weekends. Well, here's one you could uh, adopt. Uh, that's one of the uh, two Snoopy balloons passing that's right. the Dakota uh, yeah. at the uh, Thanksgiving Day Parade, uh, which as a little kid, I always called the Macy Day Parade because Macy's sponsored it. Um, the idea of a square donut with a... Um, uh, courtyard in the middle into which you could drive and drop your passengers off at the various elevator lobbies um, was repeated here at 1185 Park Avenue. In 1929, uh, the uh, architects Schwartz and Gross designed this very, very large building 
uh, it's, it's about the same size uh, as the Dakota, but much taller, of course, and designed differently. But I'd like you to look at this wonderful triple arch, this Gothic uh, entrance that the architects created, because if you just walk along Park Avenue, you won't see this. You really need to go across the street and look back and look up. And uh, then you can enjoy all of this wonderful carving, uh, which is in marvelous condition. That's really the whole point of my book, is to get readers to be aware uh, that the entrances to apartment houses in New York, at least luxury apartment houses, very often are very significantly more than merely the doors. Now, on the east side, this is, in fact, very similar to the 1185 building in that it's a square donut and uh, you can go in. Uh, the, these gates are more recent because of security. Originally, they weren't there. Uh, you could go in and uh, just as with the Dakota, uh, the four um, stair towers uh, leading upstairs are in the four corners. The difference is there's no elevators here and the apartments are smaller and the rooms are smaller because this grandiose entry way leads to a building that was built originally as a tenement for families who had at least one member who had tuberculosis. And that's why there were uh, balconies and triple hung windows so that you could go out on the balcony and enjoy the air, which was the only solution that they had um, uh, back in 1914 uh, to tuberculosis. Now, if- Fresh air was the only, was it, were you saying fresh air? I didn't know that. Fresh air was the only uh, sort of cure that the, or, or remedy that they had for tuberculosis. That's all they had. Wow. Um, and, and if you came down with tuberculosis, uh, there was a very good chance that you would not survive. Yeah. Uh, so it was marvelous when they finally learned how to uh, take care of it. Now, if only they will do the same with COVID. Uh, well, I think they're getting, I think they are definitely going in that direction, Andrew. I've had a lot of dealings with the health department here in Australia and that seems and that you know and that and and they are sort of hopefully getting on top of it which is good yes, yes it's a, it's a good thing now yeah. if if you haven't got enough room uh, to have a courtyard in the middle you can still have your transportation drop you off undercover at the front door um, by using uh, a porte cochere uh, this is the porte cochere for the entrance to the Ansonia at uh, 73rd Street and Broadway. Uh, it's 1904, uh, which coincides with the opening of the 7th Avenue IRT subway line. Uh, and I am quite sure uh, that W.E.D. Stokes, uh, who built this building, uh, was very, very aware of the timing of the subway, and he made sure that he got his building finished uh, by the time it was uh, also finished. So now we can go back to the east side and see another port cochere. This one uh, is not the entrance uh, for all of the residents of 1107 Fifth Avenue. Originally, this was the entrance for one family. Uh, their car would drop them off at that single entrance door. They would go into a small private lobby 
and would go up in a single private elevator to the triplex apartment at the top of the building. This was the home of Mr. and Mrs. E. F. Hutton, the stockbroker and his wife. Uh, she later became, after she got rid of Mr. Hutton, uh, she became uh, known as Marjorie Merriweather Post. And uh, she rented this triplex for 15 years under a leaf, lease that specified a rent of $75,000 a year that did not change for 15 years. When she moved out, she moved down to her Florida home, uh, which she called Mar El Lago. It has since been converted to commercial use. A much grander port cocher is at one Sutton Place South, as is indicated on the facade. Um, this was built in 1926, Rosario Candela, uh, working with Cross and Cross, um, uh, designed it. Uh, it has very large apartments, they're very grand, and the other side of the building looks out onto the East River. Directly across the street is two Sutton Place South. It was built five years later in 1931 to a very different economy. Uh, the architect was Emery Roth and he designed apartments inside that were totally different from the ones on the other side of Sutton Place. Much smaller apartments uh, for a completely different lifestyle. Um, those five years changed the lifestyle of New Yorkers and everyone else in the world for that matter, uh, quite dramatically and as a result, the architecture changed. This is a different kind of port cocher because here you enter on 57th Street into the uh, uh, covered area and you exit on Sutton Place. Up on East 84th Street and the East River, just past that uh, 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 warning light, on the other side of this warning light is the East River. Um, this building, 10 Gracie Square, actually the foot of 84th Street across from uh, Carl Schertz Park, is a huge building that goes all the way to 83rd Street. And yet its entrance for pedestrians is that very small single door in which a worker is sitting doing something. Uh, that with its modest canopy over it uh, is an entrance to very large apartments. But what is really the distinction of this building, the entrance to the right for cars does not go to a garage. If the concierge through those windows approves of you, he will raise the gate and you can drive in stopping at any one of the three elevator banks. Uh, if you want, you can park uh, your Rolls Royce by the side and still leave room for another car to drive past you. Uh, once Milady has come down and gotten into your car, you can continue to 83rd Street and come out there. It's the only entrance that is a port cochere that goes all the way through the building uh, to the next block. Um, Bob Stern's building at 70 uh, Vestry Street 
has a somewhat similar arrangement, but it leads to a courtyard in the center. It's, it's not this tunnel arrangement. Now, let's go to uh, some more conventional apartments that don't involve uh, um, transportation other than the usual transportation that will drop you off at the curb. And for that purpose, the protection is the green canvas awning. Uh, this awning is something that you find almost only in New York City. Uh, I've never seen any in Paris or in London or in any other city that I've visited, but it speaks New York City and it um, is added to the entrance. Uh, there isn't an architect until very recently who actually designed the entrance with the awning in mind. The entrance is an afterthought. Here, the awning slips in underneath the arch. This is a very nice entrance because it's got a moat on uh, the side street, East 64th Street. The moat used to go around on Madison Avenue, but in the 1920s, they removed the uh, moat and uh, they put in stores on the ground floor. Uh, but at least on the side street, you still have the moat, you still got a very elegant entrance. Now, another elegant building, this one older, uh, uh, the Verona, the, this building at 32 East 64th Street, uh, this is 1908. Um, 1261 Madison Avenue is 1901. Uh, fully limestone covered. Um, the photograph at the left is when it was brand new and had just opened. And you can see the moat uh, that went around Madison Avenue and uh, 90th Street. Um, the Madison Avenue moat has been removed, but the one on 90th Street uh, is still there. Uh, no stores have been uh, carved into this building. It still has two apartments to a floor, very elegant, uh, typical for a uh, luxury apartment of 1901. If I had a current photograph of the building and put them side by side, you, other than the missing um, uh, iron uh, railing at the front, uh, the building looks identical, uh, although the awnings, of course, uh, are not there today. We have air conditioning instead. Um, oh, I forgot to mention in uh, uh, Simon's uh, uh, drawing, he obviously lost his head over this building. He liked it so much and uh, uh, went running down Madison Avenue uh, trying to catch it. Uh, nearby on uh, 22 East 89th Street, uh, um, instead of losing his head, he's lost his heart over this building. Um, this was built in 1893 and it was an apartment hotel. It had a, a dining room on the ground floor. And in the uh, 1920s, um, they closed the dining room and then they rebuilt the apartments so that they would have small kitchens. Recently, uh, the entire building was vacated uh, of residential uh, occupants and uh, has been rebuilt uh, for St. David's School. Uh, I haven't been in it and I don't know what they've put into it, um, but it has become a school. Um, si Simon uh, has caught here a very 
typical New Yorker who is willing to nurture the smallest little plant uh, that uh, has the strength to come up and make its way through the sidewalk. I have seen uh, small trees growing out of the upper floors of apartment houses um, uh, that were carefully nurtured um, uh, by nearby residents. Uh, there's something about greenery that we New Yorkers love. Uh, indicate, uh, indicative of that are the green trees, the evergreen trees in front of 1158 uh, Fifth Avenue. Uh, typical for a New York apartment house, and in, in addition to the green awning, is a pair of lanterns flanking the doors and a pair of small trees or bushes in pots, concrete pots or wood pots, uh, also flanking the doors. Now, another tradition uh, that uh, you can't find terribly uh, much in New York uh, is the metal and glass marquee. This is not in front of an apartment house. Um, this is a splendid uh, marquee over the entrance um, uh, to the Carnegie Mansion. It was built in 1902 and Andrew Carnegie uh, lived in it. It was his home. It has since become the Cooper Hewitt uh, Museum. Uh, uh, Simon uh, gave this rather chic young woman in her Chanel suit uh, a rather elegant umbrella uh, that I think uh, perhaps uh, we should investigate uh, reproducing for the Cooper Hewitt. This um, uh, marquee may very well have been the inspiration for this marquee at 998 Fifth Avenue. Uh, this magnificent metal and glass uh, uh, protective uh, cover uh, juts out 12 feet from the building to the curb and runs 51 feet along the building. Uh, there you have the pair of lanterns, um, but despite my urging, the co-op uh, at 998 has declined to put in the potted uh, trees. This entrance is a particularly elegant one because it has these huge cast iron and wrought iron gates, uh, which during the day are recessed into the side walls of the vestibule. Um, uh, the entrance is actually a bronze and glass pair of doors. Uh, but at midnight, those gates are closed and unless you have the key for them, you have to ring and the uh, elevator man will come out and open the door for you, assuming he knows you. Here's a more uh, quote unquote normal luxury apartment down Fifth Avenue at 834 uh, uh, Fifth. Uh, a very handsome building uh, designed in an Italianate style by Rosario Candela uh, with the ubiquitous green canvas awning and the lanterns flanking the entrance. And because this is Fifth Avenue in place of the two pots with trees, there is uh, a little front garden. Now, if you look at the rendering at the left, uh, you'll say, but 834 isn't in the middle of the block like that. Uh, you're right. It goes all the way to the corner to 64th Street. But originally, 
the corner had a mansion and the widow of the man who built the mansion uh, was still living there and she became a holdout. Well, when the, um, uh, so of course the, the building was designed as a symmetrical mid-block building. And then when the construction had reached the fourth floor, the holdout finally gave in and agreed to vacate her house. And in fact, she moved into 834, where she lived until she died in 1959. Um, but Mr. Candela had the unenviable task of, in the middle of construction, figuring out how to extend his building to the corner um, without uh, too much expense or inconvenience to the apartments inside. Let's look at some somewhat more modest uh, entrances, uh, starting at uh, um, uh, 850, uh, which was built in 1913. Lafayette Goldstone was the architect. His son, Harmon Goldstone, was the first uh, chairman uh, of the Landmarks Commission, the first professional paid uh, chairman. If we walk south from 850, we can see 820, also with a uh, green awning that fits very nicely into the entrance that uh, uh, the architect designed. Here, we're lacking the um, uh, lanterns on the wall flanking the entrance, but there are the two uh, evergreen trees in boxes uh, next to the door. If you look at the facade, this is something you really need to look up at. It's a very strange facade. It's got a pseudo mansard at the right and what is supposed to look like a tower at the left. And at the very top above those two large stone uh, balconies, there used to be a two-story high living room that was very grand and the upper three floors, uh, the two floors of the building and the penthouse uh, belonged to the man who built the building in the first place. Uh, the apartments below uh, were stacked duplexes um, they are now mixed uh, duplexes and um, single floor apartments. Continuing further south is 800. Uh, again, the, the things that we look for, the green awning, the paired lanterns, and the paired trees um, in boxes. This is a very um, uh, gentlemanly building um, because it was designed and built just a little bit after the apartment house immediately to the north of it, the beige brick one. This is the red brick one. And look at how the uh, floors align and the belt courses align so that they are respectful of each other. It's very nice when you see that sort of design. 770 Park is a particularly handsome entrance and a particularly handsome building. Uh, above that lovely pair of entrance doors, uh, there's a carved shell uh, a little Juliet balcony and very rich Verdi antique marble. Uh, unfortunately, that marble does not do very well in New York's environment. Uh, and periodically it has to get polished. And then uh, for a few months, it looks really good. And then it weathers down to this kind of chalky look. If you look 
At the facade of the building on Park Avenue, you can see the two-story arch um, that Mr. Candela introduced to give greater importance to the entrance. But look at the corner apartment. The windows look completely different from the rest of the windows. And if you can look very carefully, you'll see that the ceiling heights are different. Those larger windows with flanking panels of brick are the entertaining floor. And, and that window is in fact the living room, uh, uh, 20 by 30 uh, dimension. And then above it are the bedroom floors with somewhat lower ceilings. This building, the, uh, the uh, top of it uh, shows what happened when they introduced the 1929 uh, uh, multiple dwelling law. It enabled these setbacks with terraces. Um, the building to the left, 760 Park, was built under the prior law, which restricted how high you could go. So under the new law, uh, there was able to have uh, designed into the building all of these setback terraces and the top of the building looks somewhat like a Tuscan um, mountain town where the houses uh, are all tumbling down the side of the mountain. Continuing further south, we get to 740 Park, a very grand, fully limestone uh, uh, covered facade uh, designed by Mr. Candela uh, again and built by Jackie, uh, Jackie Onassis's um, grandfather. And this was the childhood home uh, of Jackie Bouvier who later became Jackie Kennedy. Um, Michael Gross uh, has written a wonderful book that's a biography of not only the building, um, but lots of the people uh, who lived in the building. Um, it's quite grand, um, but the entrance is very restrained elegance. That's very fine marble. It's well carved, but it's very restrained. Unlike the uh, entrance on 71st Street to the next building south, this is 730 Park. You see with the doors, it's a very simple, straightforward entrance with a green awning over it, but immediately above the green awning, there's wonderful carving if you bother to stop and, whoops, there we are, sorry about that. Uh, if you bother to stop and look at what's going on directly above the awning, but then you need to go back across the street and put your back against the wall of 740. Uh, that's the only way to make sure you're secure and you don't fall over because you need to look up all the way to the fifth floor. And what the architect has put as an embellishment with pilasters and uh, a, uh, entablature and a, a broken Baroque pediment, and then more pilasters, and another entablature, and then a pair of bowling balls, and a cartouche, and on top of the whole thing, he's got an obelisk. Uh, this is an interpretation of the facade of an English country house of the Renaissance period. And despite being uh, uh, more than four stories high uh, and rather over the top grandiose, it's still very low key because all of that stonework doesn't extend out from the building more than uh, a very few inches. 
let's pop across the park again. Look at the entrance to the San Remo. It also goes up to the sill of the fifth floor, but vastly louder in its design, much more bold carving, more going on, uh, just a succession all the way up of grandiosity, uh, a different way of doing things on Central Park West from the way it's done on Park Avenue. But you can also make a comparison with Fifth Avenue. If you will look at the entrance doors under the canopy, you'll see that they're bronze. Well, you can only see one, but the other one is the same. Uh, they're bronze, uh, they're polished bronze, and they have uh, those elaborate uh, shields. Uh, this is designed by Emery Roth. On Fifth Avenue, Emery Roth also designed 993. It's conceptually similar, but much more reticent, much more measured in how it speaks to the street. But look at these doors. They're the identical doors from the San Remo. The difference is the co-op uh, some years ago decided to oxidize them to make them even uh, more gentle and quiet. Emery Roth apparently liked these doors very much because he installed them at 15 West 81st Street and he originally installed them at all of the entrances, and there are four of them, to the Beresford at 81st Street and Central Park West. I remember them, I grew up around the corner from, from there. Uh, at some point, those doors were removed and they were replaced with very simple bronze doors with lots of glass. Why that was done, I can't say. Different kinds of doors come in different historical periods. This is Romanesque, the round arch with the succession uh, of moldings going in uh, uh, is indicative of that. This is 1215 Fifth Avenue on Upper Fifth Avenue. If you look way up at the top, uh, up here, you'll see there are two uh, um, rows of rooms. Originally, that was one room 60 feet long, 25 feet high, with a huge fireplace at each end. It was the apartment of Arthur Brisbane, uh, who was one of Hearst's publishers, and he was the one who built uh, this building and provided for himself an apartment at the top. A different kind of Romanesque, this is Tuscan. And uh, uh, this is uh, a lot of um, uh, colored glazed terracotta elements so that even the uh, sculptures here in uh, these demi loons and the sculptures on either side of the entrance, uh, they're not carved limestone. They were molded in clay that was then baked. And that's what terracotta is. Uh, the building is a very nice one at uh, 79th Street uh, and Park Avenue on the southwest corner. It originally had stacked duplexes with lovely curved um, staircases connecting them. Uh, I believe there are only two of those left. Uh, the other apartments uh, were cut into simplex apartments um, during the 30s uh, when the duplexes couldn't rent. 
Uh, I'd like to think that this uh, dreadfully chic young woman uh, and her driver helping her with her purchases uh, that she lives in one of the duplexes. Um, uh, Simon has given her a Rolls Royce uh, to be driven around in, uh, so she deserves no less than that. Another kind of architecture you'll find in New York is Gothic. Not terribly much of it, um, but what we have of it is really quite good. Uh, this is an early um, uh, apartment house, mid-block apartment house uh, between 87th and 88th, number 1067, that was designed by C.P.H. Gilbert, uh, not to be confused with Cass Gilbert, who was a different architect. Um, uh, but C.P.H. Gilbert, uh, I think, uh, designed only one apartment house, this one. But if you look a little further north and a little further south, you will find two magnificent mansions that Mr. Gilbert designed. The Warburg Mansion that is now the Jewish Museum and the mansion uh, that uh, was built for Isaac Fletcher uh, at the south corner of 79th Street. It's now occupied by a Ukrainian arts um, uh, uh, company, uh, institution. Uh, they bought it from the estate of the last descendant of Peter Stuyvesant. He was Augustus Van Horn Stuyvesant. And after his sister died, he was living in that mansion all by himself. It's quite lovely. And luckily, uh, the Ukrainians don't have terribly much money, so they haven't changed it. So inside, uh, it's uh, pretty close to the original. This almost neo-medieval um, building with terracotta work all over it, glazed polychromed terracotta uh, that Simon likes so much, he wants to drag the entire world to living there. Uh, I assume that's a real estate broker who's trying to get people uh, to come to a showing of an apartment. Um, the uh, lower floors uh, of this building, uh, the apartments were bought by the adjoining Browning School and internally connected so that they could have a little more uh, space. Uh, what I like about this building in particular is uh, that the architect Henry Janeway Hardenberg, who designed the Dakota, and who later went on to design uh, the Plaza Hotel and lots of other hotels and buildings in New York. When he finally retired, he took an apartment not in the Dakota, but in this building. And it was where he died uh, in 1913. Andrew, can I just ask something? Yes, please. So I note there the red canopy is there any real reason why but we have the original the original green ones and then occasionally we get the red one and i've never actually bothered to find out why we would have some would have red and some would have green and what the balance would be i i am not sure um uh, certainly uh, like 740 park uh it has a gray awning that picks up the color of the gray of the marble surround and I've seen some beige awnings uh, where uh, the limestone around it was beige. Um, most of them are green, but because there's some very bright blue in the terracotta, they may mm -hmm. have felt that a green awning would clash and uh, red would look better. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in a moment or two, we'll see another red awning uh, that uh, uh, Simon liked so much uh, that he created another umbrella um, for a chap uh, near it. 
But before we get there, uh, let's look at another neo-medieval building, 1000 Park Avenue. It's a building I've known from the time I was a, a child, and it always bothered me. Uh, uh, this entrance looks like it stops abruptly and it doesn't look right this way. These two monks uh, may be the Bing brothers of Bing and Bing who built this. Uh, we don't really know. But in addition to this straight line, we have these four very strange um, pieces of terracotta work. Um, and I felt that something was missing, that there must have been a marquee that uh, uh, would have sat right here and be held up here. And recently, I found this ancient photograph that very clearly uh, is from when the building was new, which was 1916, uh, because it still has the curved um, uh, center malls on Park Avenue. And uh, here we have a marquee and sitting exactly where I thought it ought to. And here are the rods uh, that are holding it up. You can only see this one, but presumably uh, there are three more. And uh, I decided that I like it so much that I'm now trying to plant the seed with the co-op and the architect who works for the co-op uh, to see if they'd be willing to recreate the marquee and put the building back to the way it was originally designed. Now, this is the other red awning. We popped back to the west side for 44 West 77th Street. Uh, and I'm not sure whether that fellow uh, who's put up his umbrella and is testing to see whether the rain is coming down, uh, whether he bought that umbrella to blend in with his uh, awning or whether he merely works for the Traveler's Insurance Company. This building has the most wonderful Gothic entrance imaginable, but originally all the way up the building was ornament in terracotta that was consistent with this entrance. It proved to have been defective and it had to be removed in the 1940s. It still is a magnificent building, but if you know what it looked like, and I have a photograph of the entire building when it was brand new, um, it's really sad. Back across to the east side, the same architects, Hardy and Short, uh, designed 45 East uh, 66th Street. Now, you can't see in this photograph, you just get a hint of it, but up at the top and around the corner, uh, it's, it's got a rounded corner tower, uh, there is the sort of ornamentation uh, that 44 West 77th Street used to have. Uh, decorated buildings bring an awful lot of pleasure to ordinary pedestrians who walk by them and smile. You can't walk by this window or this door to a doctor's office on either side of this entrance and not smile when you look up at all of the animals that have been carved into the limestone. They're really quite splendid and very few of them are duplicated. That's the uh, a key to recognizing that they're not terracotta. They're actually individually carved. This building was put up in 1931 by John D. Rockefeller Jr. Let's look at some doors. 
Uh, this is a very handsome pair of doors to 1016 Fifth Avenue. But notice there's no handle on the door. This building, you won't go in unless the doorman uses the handle on the inside to let you in. This spectacular piece of Art Deco uh, um, metalwork is at 7 Gracie Square, East 84th Street, between East End Avenue and the East River. Uh, it has to be one of the most magnificent entrance doors and um, uh, uh, over mantle there uh, that uh, uh, you'll find anywhere. The Art Deco period uh, was very creative. Here's another one at 3 East 84th Street uh, with these, I think they're Monel metal. Uh, they don't seem to be bronze. They're certainly not... Uh, uh, aluminum or stainless steel. Uh, this is a co-op with one apartment to a floor. Uh, very fine, just off Fifth Avenue, but no doorman. There's a buzzer to the left of the door. Uh, a little later, this one from 1936 is 19 East 72nd Street. A rather amazing uh, piece of, uh, I guess it's some sort of cast material. Uh, I don't know uh, exactly what it is. It's still there. Uh, the artist who created it, um, um, name of uh, Genuine, uh, did a lot of sculpture in Rockefeller Center. But one thing he did was he took these entrance doors and put little animals. There's a snail, uh, there's a something else, there's a little chameleon up here, and in, in the shadow there's some more. And I was delighted to see, last time I went by there, that those doors had been taken down and restored and re-varnished and all the carvings are still there. This was designed. I just want, and sorry, I missed that, Andrew. Whereabouts is this one? Where was this, this, this doorway? Is 19 East 72nd Street on the oh, north okay. side of the street in, uh, at the corner of Madison Avenue. Uh, it okay. is on the site of the very, very large Tiffany family multiple dwelling. Uh, a huge um, house uh, that was designed by Stanford White, and it was designed to have a very, very large apartment for Charles Tiffany, who founded the Tiffany Jewelry Store, um, a somewhat smaller apartment uh, for his daughter, and then at the top, a huge studio apartment for his son, Louis Comfort Tiffany, who was responsible for all that lovely Tiffany glass that we see all over the place. Um, but when he finally died uh, during the depression, his estate sold the mansion. Uh, nobody would buy that mansion. It was a very strange, lugubrious one. Uh, and this developer, Mr. Smith, um, had Candela, along with Mott Schmidt, design number 19, and he included a very large duplex for himself. Developers very often do that. Mm. Now, it's interesting with all the imagery there too. It's like a Greek, almost Egyptian with the cat at the bottom, the snail on the door. It's fascinating, isn't it? Yes, yes, very much mm. so. Now, here's... You know, very unusual. Where... Well, this I think is equally unusual. This is 49 East 96th Street. It looks like a theater. And in fact, mm. on Broadway, on the east side of Broadway, 
Uh, I think it's between uh, 90th and 91st or somewhere in there, 89th, 90th, uh, there is what had been the Midtown Movie Theater. And the facade of it looks for all the world like this one. And it turns out that the architect of this apartment house, uh, his primary practice was designing theaters. Uh, this one on uh, uh, obviously East 68th Street, uh, talk about bold terracotta work. Look at that scroll uh, uh, up at the, the top of the second floor. Um, and that frieze uh, of diamonds in light green and dark green uh, goes all the way around the building. Uh, quite ornamented in very non-conventional uh, uh, fashion. More conventional over on East End Avenue uh, is number one with its wonderful carved keystone, number 25 with an equally wonderful car carved keystone, and jumping to the 21st century, number 20, which is a new, uh, uh, opened just a, a few years ago, uh, a new apartment house designed by uh, Bob Stern and his partners, uh, has a pedestrian entrance on East End Avenue that looks very, very much like 770 Park, but it also has a drive-in courtyard. Uh, it's quite civilized and quite different. And new apartment houses are doing that. Here's one on 79th Street between Madison and Park that's almost invisible despite how tall it is because you don't see it on the street. It's behind this row of brownstones. Well, in fact, the three brownstones in the middle are part of the apartment house and the entrance to the apartment house at, uh, shown on the right goes right through one of them. But it's so quiet and gentlemanly by being set back. Also on 79th Street is what I think is the all time best new apartment house on the Upper East Side or anywhere else. It's 135 East 79th Street. It's designed by William Sofield. And uh, look at the detail. He's got a single entrance door, but it's framed in this absolutely gorgeous marble. Uh, he's then got a two-story high arch that is lovely with a huge window announcing the number of the building that lets all of the sunlight into the lobby. So uh, going home would be a very pleasant experience going into the lobby. Now, in front of the building, he's got a traditional awning reinterpreted in metal and what looks like uh, a fabric drape at the corner is actually metal. So he's taken a traditional feature and made it modern. Those pots with trees in them that flank so many entrances, here's the pot and here's the pear tree growing out of it. There's an owl up there uh, there are some pears, there are a couple of little animals. And what I think is the best part of it, this pear tree on these, on both sides, were personally carved by the architect of the building. It turned out that he's a stone carver besides. So this is all time best new apartment house. I, I agree. will close with another apartment house. Yes, I know you're going to say, who are you kidding? That's the New York Public Library. Anybody knows that. But did you know 
that inside that New York Public Library was constructed and still exists a seven room apartment that was specifically designed for the administrative manager who lived with his family inside the library. So this is an apartment house for one family only. The story has been told in a historical novel that my uh, friend Fiona Davis um, wrote called The Lions of Fifth Avenue. Uh, and of course the family name was Lions, but with a Y, so she jokes on that. And this very cool cat taking a selfie with the uh, uh, lion and the uh, library uh, behind uh, him or her uh, is no doubt a tourist knowing some of our best architecture. Thank you very much. What happened to the apartment? What happened to the apartment inside the library? It's still there, but it's being used as storage now. Uh, okay. They don't have anyone living there. Hi, hi, right. hi, I'm back. Well, thank you, both of you. This this was really fun. Um, it's really good. Uh, let me just uh, start by reminding people if they want to ask questions, to send them via chat, and uh, I'll relay them to both Andrew and Simon. Um, if you'd like to turn your video on, uh, feel free to do so as well. Um, and let's start with a question for Simon. Uh, we noticed that most of your drawings have this unexpected element to it. Uh, it's either the Snoopy or the woman carrying the world behind her. Like, what is your inspiration for those uh, unexpected elements? Okay. Um, well, I, when I first started to draw about 30 years ago, I had uh, two nieces and they're about, I don't know, four or five or something like that. So they would look at an architectural drawing that I'd be doing and they weren't, they were okay, but they weren't that interested. So what I do is I put a little type of cartoon in. The minute I put a cartoon in it, they sort of, they would immediately liven up. And I realised that that would sort of get their attention. And then, and then I discovered adults were just the same, that if you give them, I've lost you there. If you give them something to look at, um, they will, it sort of like gives them a talking point or something like that. And then, of course, it's an opportunity for me just to make a sort of comment. The older I get, the less obvious I find the comments. I don't often, I was saying to Andrew beforehand, I often can't remember why I did them, but they meant something to me at the time. They're often derived from somebody I know or an incident that's happened. And I think they liven the pictures up. It's as simple as that. It's not very complex. It just livens it up. And every so often I decide to take them out. And people say, no, no, we want them back in again. So these days I'm going through a decade period putting them all back in again and enjoy. I'm trying to use little animals again. That was the little cat outside the state library, the uh, public library there. Um, so that, anyway, if that answers the question. I'll tell you something sent me a message. I don't know where it is, but it says, Simon, did you see a spike in pet adoptions or fostering during the quarantine? The, so, I don't know. That's come up on my chat here. And the answer to that is um, we had a different COVID thing to you. But yes, uh, our, as I said, I, I live in a seven, eight storey apartment and we definitely noted the increase in, in animals. But also I just know there's been a, no, a notable social change because of COVID. I, I mean, I know it's a terrible thing and I do feel very sorry for America, but I also think there have been some very good things that have come out of it. And dare I say, it, one of them is actually that, that, um, that, you know, animals and animals, people like animals on that. So I know I'm wandering off the point there, but anyway, there you go. Mm -hmm. No, thank you for uh, responding to the messages that went straight to you. Um, and we did see I myself adopted two cats this uh, this year. So um, we increased our household by 100%. Um, so uh, well, they, they, there's a lot of scientific, there's a lot of scientific, I was going to say there's a lot of sort of science to back the fact that being associated with animals and having pets and that is very good for human beings. It goes back, you know, taps into our deepest, you know, things. So I, I think it's a wonderful thing, you know. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. I cut you off. 
Uh, no, no problem. I was just going to, we received a lot of questions uh, specific about building. So I'm gonna just pick a few for Andrew to respond. Um, okay. There are actually two questions about the Dakota, uh, which is not on the east side, but it's a very, very famous building. Uh, do you know if the archway, if those are Gustavino tiles? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch that question. Uh, are those Gustavino tiles on the archway of the Dakota? Oh, um, I had always assumed they were, I sent an email to the architect who is the one who does all of the work for them in the building, all, all the necessary work. And I asked him if he had uh, uh, could enlighten me and he never answered the email. Uh, this is typical for the Dakota. The people who live in the Dakota are absolutely paranoid and for good reason. Uh, I mean, there was a major assassination there. And um, there are a lot of people uh, living there who want to be left alone. So they don't, they instruct everyone who works there, don't say anything to anyone. So I haven't been able to find out whether in fact they're Guastavino tiles or not. Um, uh, Raphael Guastavino had come over from Catalonia. Uh, he lived in Barcelona. He came here with his son uh, while the Dakota was being built. He later established himself and did contracting work himself, but initially, he would have been looking for any kind of place to put his Catalonian tile system that he brought with him. So logic argues to me, anyhow, that those uh, should be Guastavino tiles, but I can't give you a definitive answer. So it's still about the Dakota. Do you know if they had elevators when they were originally built? Yes, and uh, they were wonderful elevators. I remember them as a little boy. Uh, I first went into that building when I was perhaps 10 or 11 years old. Uh, and the elevators, I thought, were uh, raised by hand the way my aunt's um, uh, dumbwaiter was because there was a cable that went up through the middle of the car and the elevator woman, a very proper looking woman in white lace and black bombazine looking like a waitress at Schrafts uh, 60 years ago, she would pull on that cable. And I thought she was pulling up the elevator. Well, of course she wasn't. What she was doing was opening or closing a valve that allowed water to flow from one reservoir to another and it was that water power that uh, drove the elevators. And they kept that, oh gosh, it, it can't have been more than 20 years ago when they finally scrapped that and put in electric elevators. That is a wonderful story. Mm -hmm. Simon, uh, another question about for you, and I think this, I wonder if this is gonna be a, a, a difficult one to answer. Do you have a favorite building that you drew? Oh my. <laughs> yeah, that's a hard one. Um, yes. <laughs> well, the Dakota, the Dakota was, that's actually one of the reasons I, that my background, I was commissioned to go to New York uh, to do a set of paintings. And one of the pictures was the Dakota and we knew the Dakota in Australia because of the John Lennon situation. Of course, everybody did. 
Um, and so, but it's very, it was very, it was weird seeing it in real life. Um, I remember, I, I, I don't, I, I remember, and before I met Andrew, I had just wandered around. I had a sort of set of structures that I did. To be honest, I did the museums and and uh, the Guggenheim places like that. I did the sort of well-known places, you know, the big public institutions. And I remember being on the west side. Actually, I had been asked to do the Dakota for an Australian. And then I remember walking somewhere on the west side, and I just remember seeing these incredible, I can't even think of which one it was. It was a big terracotta one. I remember thinking, these are remarkable buildings. And actually, I, maybe this would help. My girlfriend and I were in New York and we had been, we were going down Fifth Avenue on a bus and I was sitting, I think I was sitting on the outside and I remember going down and I'd done, as I said, the, the library and the Metropolitan, all those sorts of places. And I remember looking at, the, and so the bus was driving down and I just remember sort of looking to the left and we went past these buildings and I remember thinking, well, I really wouldn't, they wouldn't warrant me doing a whole painting because they, they weren't really elaborate enough at the top. But I do remember thinking, gee, but some of those entrances are nice, aren't they? So I must have seen about 10 or 15, this is a long time ago now, in a row. Um, and then a, 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 a long time later, I, Andrew got in touch and then we started to, to communicate. And then to say, have I got a favourite building? No. And in fact, when I look at these pictures, I really enjoyed the talk, Andrew. It's fascinating hearing you talk about them. Um, but I change each time. I'm sure I'm the same as you lot. You know, I look at them one week and I think, well, this is nice. And then next week, oh, well, that's not. The one I liked today was that last one you showed with the architect. You should write him a message and tell him how much you like, if you haven't already, how much you oh, like the sculpture. I, I, I have. And it turned out that I didn't know that he was a member of the same club that I am. So we have promised that as soon as we are both fully vaccinated, uh, yep. we've got to go back there and have lunch and chat. I have never met That's right. That's him face to face. How old is he? Uh, I think he's 20 years younger than I am. I think yeah. he's uh, about 60 or so, something yeah. like that. And Lara, question for you, which is your favorite building and which is Andrew's favorite building? So take the heat off me. I'll, I'll let Andrew respond to that first. Oh dear, oh gosh. That's I, right, it's hard, isn't it? There's so many, you know, uh, um, uh, one of the things that I really like about doing this build, uh, book was that I got to look at so many yeah. buildings um, that, I hadn't seen before. And the mm. photographer, uh, Kenneth Grant, who took all the wonderful, wonderful photographs for the book, um, he would go wandering around the city. And when he saw an interesting building, he'd snap a picture of it. And he would send me pictures and say, look what I just found this afternoon. And I would then go there and this would be a building I had never seen before. I mean, there are so many streets in New York uh, that uh, even though I've lived here in Manhattan my entire life, there's lots of streets I've never walked on. And some of them have wonderful buildings on them and Ken snapped pictures. Uh, you know, when I first... When I first started to paint, so it's about 30 years ago now, I mean, I was like you, I was a lawyer to start with, but when I started to paint, and I remember just sort of almost falling, well, actually I'd worked for architects, but I fell, onto paint, fell into painting architecture. And if I'd got a dollar for every time someone would look at a painting of mine, they'd say, oh, I didn't realise how beautiful that building was. And it was always there in front of us. It was right there in front. And I reckon though your book it does this exactly. You walk along, you probably people walk past these entrances all the time and they really, you know, none of us stop and have a good look. And when you do stop and have a good look, you realise how marvellous. Although personally, I think it's the moral of that story is there's beauty everywhere. Everywhere you look, there's beauty if you stop and look at it. Yes, unquestionably, it's everywhere. 730 Park, that uh, uh, five-storey mm. high uh, English Renaissance country house glued onto the facade of an apartment house. I, I think if I had to select one, it's so over the top wonderful and yet so low. Well, actually, on that one, on that one there, Andrew, on that one there, I noticed that there's a spare, uh, spare um, archway, uh, sort of, I don't know what you call it, that thing. It's, it's looking for a statue. So you should write oh, to the owners of the building and tell yes. them. 
Oh, what's it no, called? No. What's the name of that thing again? What's that? What's it called? The the thing where you have like the. Well, it's a, it's a, a niche for a statue. Niche. Mm, and, that's it. I need the statue. Uh, it would be rather fun to come with a cherry picker on top of a truck uh, at midnight one night and install an absolutely mm. outrageous statue up there and wait to see how long it takes before anyone notices. Mm. That mm. would be an interesting experiment. Um, yeah. 30 on the corner at the second floor has a huge carving of a ram right on the corner of the building. It's a marvelous piece of sculpture and mm. at least is close enough to the sidewalk so people could see it. But that wonderful Renaissance facade on the side street, I showed a picture of that to a friend of mine who is a high-end real estate broker who has sold several apartments in that building and has been in and out of that building many, many times over the years. He said he had never seen that facade and he thought he knew the building. Hmm. People, but that's like, isn't that like life though? You know that you walk past that. You, 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 that I love that aspect of life that you, you, that you never, never. If you keep a wide open mind and wide eyes, it never ceases to amaze me. And then, like I like that one of the snail on the door. By the way, I've never seen that before. Yes, the one that you showed just up the oh, end there. That's a delightful one. So <laughs> Carl Genuin was the name of the uh, sculptor. Uh, yes, it's delightful. If you and Lara, you haven't, Lara, you haven't told us your favorite building. We've yes. we've done all the talk. You've got to tell us yours. Well, I put I've you on the spot. Trying to think uh, while you're talking, which will be my favorite building, and it's it's a cop out. I I can choose. I do appreciate the unexpected in a building, and. Um, this conversation just reminded me of a story right very early, um, very early in the pandemic here in the United States, my husband and I decided to start taking what we call sanity walks um, at 5 p.m. And one day we we're coming back to our apartment and I noticed that the house in front of our apartment had this beautiful wrought iron balconies that I've never seen before. I've been living there for two years yes. and they're right there mm. on our face. And mm. we're just like, mm. was this ever always here? Mm. And it's 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 great to discover those little things. And I, I think that's my favorite part about architecture in New York. I can't choose a favorite building. Uh, that's well said. So let, that's right, hope, I agree. Let's hope that all the people uh, who've been looking at this uh, uh, will realize that there's a lot of beauty out there and now go out and walk the streets and look up mm. and see all of the effort that an awful lot of architects and anonymous stone carvers have uh, given the street. And yeah. also, and also, they should be the, the original developers and the people who put them up, who allowed the architects to indulge themselves and the sculptors. I think it's a, I agree, you know, and they'll, and I hope there'll be more people. Oh, I'm sure there will be. It'll come after us and, and, you know, it'll be, a, you know, people will acknowledge what's there. Look at what's there. That's it. Yeah, definitely. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Um, we have many more questions that I've received, but we don't have time for all of them. So if you sent a question that wasn't responded to tonight, that we didn't get to it, please feel free to email them to me. I'll forward them to both Andrew or Simon and we can get back to you. Um, but on that note, uh, thank you very much, Andrew and Simon for joining us tonight and this morning for you, Simon. And thank you for everyone that joined us um, from the audience. And I'll see you next time. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye now. Bye, Andrew. Bye, Lara. Bye.